Welcome to yet another episode of Game of Thrones Abridged on Alt Swift X. Today we are reading Eddard 8, A Game of Thrones, the 8th Eddard chapter. And this chapter is a bit of a shorter one. It's fairly brief. The, the, the chapter length in this book is actually quite inconsistent, uh, which feels a little bit sort of messy, but I suppose that's how it goes when you're writing a book as complex, a story as complex as this. Things don't always neatly fit into a neat, ordered structure, just like life doesn't always fit into a neat, ordered structure. It doesn't fit into nice season arcs, you know, it doesn't fit into, uh, into beginning, middle, end so well, so sometimes you get these inconsistencies. So the Ned chapter begins with a discussion, a heated discussion, between Ned Stark and Robert Baratheon and the rest of the small council about whether to assassinate Daenerys Targaryen. So Daenerys Targaryen is far away in Essos, and uh, news has just come by via Varys that Daenerys is pregnant. And so the threat to Robert here, King Robert, is that if Daenerys Targaryen, daughter of the Targaryen dynasty, gives birth to a son, that could constitute a potential future political threat to Robert. Because after all, Robert is the first non-Targaryen king that Westeros has had in centuries. So it wouldn't be all that crazy a thing if if Westeros decided, hey, mm, maybe the Targaryens were all right. Let's go back to that. That seems a possibility. So Robert would like to assassinate Daenerys and her unborn child. Ned, meanwhile, is begging Robert not to go ahead with this. He doesn't want a child to be assassinated. And Robert is enraged that Ned would try to prevent Robert's course of action. He, His voice is loud as a thunderclap, because, of course, Robert is a Baratheon of Storm's End, and theirs is the thunder. Uh, and, uh, and he's just sort of yelling and, and repeating himself, which is sort of how Robert speaks. Uh, and all the other councillors, meanwhile, the other great politicians who run Westeros, are just sort of pretending they're not there. They're trying not to get involved in this discussion because they are moral cowards, pretty much. They're, 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 they're weak, ethically. Whereas Ned is the only one standing up for what he perceives to be right, the protection of Daenerys and her child. Uh, but Robert is like, nope. We gotta have her killed. I will not just sit here here and do nothing. I see the shadow of the axe when it is hanging over my own neck. So Robert is seeing the sword of Damocles here. You ever hear you ever hear about Damocles? Damocles was this guy who who went and visited the king. This this isn't in Westeros, this is in Greece, I think. And Damocles went up to the king of Greece and he said, Hey, Fuck, you have it good, don't you? Being a king, uh, just sitting there being being fanned with palm leaves and eating peeled grapes from the from the belly buttons of of nubile nubile peasant women. I mean, that's got to be a good time. Royalty, right? You get the nice clothes. You get you know sort of carried about. You got you got you know little little fools dancing for your for your pleasure. Uh, that's got to be great, being the king. I'd like to be the king. And the king's like, Damocles, you don't know what the shit you're talking about, boy. Let me show you, let me show you what it, just how fun it is to be the king. And so Damocles, Damocles, so the king's like, come and, come and sit on the throne. I, I will get off the throne. Damocles, you sit on the throne and see what it's like. See what it's like for yourself to be the king. And so Damocles is like, shit, all right, great, let's, all right, thanks, mate, Cobber, let's, I'll have a, I'll have a seat on the old throne around, you know? Be great. And he sits on the throne, and then he looks up, and hanging above the throne, hanging f- from a length of horsehair, a single 
horsehair delicately dangling. Above the throne is a sword, hanging point down, hovering above Damocles sitting on the throne. So, the moral of that story is that uh, it's tough at the top. Uh, to, to, To be sitting on the throne, to rule, to be king, is to be continually threatened by outside forces, assassination, other people trying to be king, responsibility. When you're in charge, there is there is risk inherent in that. Power is inherently dangerous, and that's what the Sword of Damocles represents. I mean, you could argue that, at least in the context of these medieval societies, uh, there are there are other swords hovering over the heads of anyone who isn't the king. If you're not the king, you're probably more likely to, you know die of dysentery, you know, shit your guts out, or just have all your shit taken by the king's men in the form of tax or, or something. So it's not maybe the greatest analogy, but the point is that there is, there, is, there is threat inherent in power, and King Robert recognizes that. He sees the Sword of Damocles in the form of Daenerys Targaryen, and that's why he wants her killed. Page two. So then... Ned's like, no, but look, this isn't really a threat to you. This isn't really a sword of Damocles. Uh, This this threat is the shadow of a shadow, 20 years removed. The shadow of a shadow. Which which kind of interestingly echoes Jorah's description of Viserys Targaryen as only the shadow of a snake. It's funny when characters in this story echo each other's sort of wording and ideas... Uh, because, of course, it doesn't actually make sense for them to have... I mean, unless they came, whatever. So uh, so they're like... And then Varys is like... Well, they, well then we find out that the channel of, of how Robert found out about this is that Varys heard it from Jorah, that Daenerys is pregnant. And we find out that Jorah has been betraying Daenerys by leaking information to Varys. We learn that Jorah is hoping to get a pardon to be allowed to return home to Westeros, because, of course, he was... Uh, of 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 Bear Island, of House Mormont, until he sold slaves, and there's that whole sorry story with Lanes Hightower, which we we'll, won't get into here. But basically, Jorah wants wants to wants to suck up to Varys so that he can get a pardon and be allowed to return home. And Jorah is informing on Danny to Varys, uh, and and Ned's like, look, but still, this this just isn't a threat because. You know, if the girl might miscarry, and the girl might birth a daughter instead of a son, and and the daughter and the and the child might die in infancy. So what they're specifically concerned about is is Daenerys birthing a son, because it's only a male heir in this in this patriarchal society that would be a political threat, because only a male could claim kingship as a Targaryen. It's interesting that they seem unconcerned about Viserys. Perhaps they dismiss him as the fool he is. Uh, and, and, and Robert calls them dragon spawn. Any, a, a Targaryen baby is dragon spawn, not even human. Robert detests the Targaryens, mostly because of what Rhaegar did to Lyanna, or what Robert believes Rhaegar did to Lyanna. Uh, and, and then we get into a bit of sort of political philosophy when the, when the small council comes into it. So Varys is like, you look, it is a terrible thing to murder to murder a child and a mother, uh, but you've got to do terrible things. You must do vile things for the good of the realm when you presume to rule. Uh, and and Renly says, well, Renly, somewhat less philosophically, says, look, we should have fucking killed them yonks ago, mate. We should have killed Daenerys and Viserys ages ago. The only reason we didn't is because Robert was listening to John Arryn back then. So we learn that John Arryn was also a merciful man. Another merciful man who dies before his time. They have a habit of doing that in Westeros, don't they? Merciful men, the merciful dead. Uh, and and Ned says, mercy is never a mistake, Lord Renly. And Ned has never said a less true thing, <laughs> as he is soon to learn. Uh, and he tells the story of how back in Robert's Rebellion, Barristan Selmy was fighting on the side of the Targaryens. Uh, and he killed a dozen of, of Robert's men. But when Barristan was brought to the king, all wounded and, and near to near dead, 
Roose Bolton, nasty Roose Bolton, said, let's just slit Barristan's throat. He's one of the enemy. But then Robert's like, I'm not going to fucking punish a bloke for, for fighting well and being loyal to his king. I, and so instead, Robert gives Barristan his own uh, personal maester, his own doctor, to heal him up. So Robert showed mercy to Barristan Selmy. Um... Which is interesting. Why does he show? Why does he show mercy to his enemy Barristan, but not show mercy to his enemy Daenerys? Uh, Robert's when Ned points that out. Robert's like, nah, but that was different, you know. Robert, so Barristan was a knight of the King's Guard, and Ned says, well, Daenerys is a fourteen-year-old girl. So, Ned, so Robert has a bit of a, bit of a uh, inconsistent morality here. He is willing to accept and protect big, tough fighting men like Robert himself, but he's not willing to be merciful towards 14-year-old girls with whom he doesn't identify. We are surely more merciful towards those who feel more similar to us, right? That's why, uh, that's why twins don't murder each other statistically as often as, uh, as peasants murder kings. I'm assuming that's true. Uh, and... So and and so Ned's like, but come on, like if 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 you're the king and you're gonna start killing kids, isn't that the same shit we we rebelled against Ares for in the first place? Don't we just become the enemy if we stoop to their level by murdering innocents like Ares did? Uh, and Robert is just angered by these not unreasonable arguments. His face goes purple and he says, "Not another word." And you know you're a shitty leader when your response to criticism is to try to silence it instead of responding to it. Uh, and and Robert just says, I'm sick of talk, I'm sick of talk, fuck this, I just want Daenerys dead. Uh, and and Barris and Selmy speaks up, and he is the one other person other than Ned who says, no, we shouldn't kill Daenerys. He says that there is honour in facing an enemy on the battlefield, but none in killing him in his mother's womb. And there are two interesting things about that. First, Barristan seems more concerned about killing the unborn child of Daenerys than he seems concerned about killing Daenerys, which seems morally odd. And also there's just this fundamental idea that it's not okay to assassinate someone, but it is okay to hack them to death on a battlefield. Why should those two things be considered different in that way? Isn't killing killing? Tywin Lannister has a good quote about, is is it not better to murder a few hundred men at dinner than to murder thousands in battle, which was his justification for the Red Wedding, and you've got to admit that it's not a bad argument. Surely it is better to to, to kill swiftly a smaller number than many in a long, drawn-out way. Game of Thrones is very much preoccupied with these kinds of ideas of the ethics of conflict and violence, and I think it's a good discussion that happens in this chapter. Lots of different viewpoints about what is right. Uh, but Robert has little patience for it. Uh, and Pycelle, Pycelle also, also, uh, weighs in, and he makes a similar argument to Varys about how, like, yeah, if we are, we either kill this, this, this babe now, or we let war and rebellion happen later, which could be many thousands of deaths. So in a utilitarian sense, it's better to, to, to switch the trolley on the trolley tracks and, and kill the one instead of the many, which, yeah, seems a pretty reasonable argument. Although Pycelle has some other interesting lines in here. He, he mentions how um, Pycelle claims to have counseled King Aerys Targaryen as loyally as he counsels Robert Baratheon now. Uh, which is funny, because we actually find out later that Pycelle was not very loyal to Ares at all. We learn that Pycelle deliberately counselled Ares to let Tywin Lannister into his city in King's Landing, knowing full well that uh, Tywin was going to sack the city. Uh, so what that what that line is is a subtle, sin, a subtle hint that Pycelle is not very loyal to King Robert. Uh, he seems more loyal to the Lannisters. Uh, and finally, Littlefinger speaks, and he makes a sort of a gross analogy about how, well, if you're fucking an ugly woman, better to just fuck her and be done with it than than pansy about. Uh, and Rob and Ned is sort of <laughs> embarrassed and is sort of aghast at the analogy. Uh, and and it is a gross analogy. And uh, and so basically, Robert's like, all right, look, two of you, Ned and Barristan, think that we shouldn't kill. Daenerys, everyone else thinks we should. So we're gonna. Let's kill her. And they immediately start talking about how to kill her. Varys mentions the tears of Lys poisoning her, and Pycelle looks at Varys suspiciously. 
uh, which is uh, perhaps right, given that uh, John Aaron was murdered with the tears of Lise. Uh, so it's funny that Varys goes around su- suggesting killing people with that poison. But the king complains that poison is a coward's weapon. So again, there's this idea that killing people in some ways is more ethical than in other ways. It's 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 not manly enough to poison someone. You've got to do it with a sword. And Ned weighs in on his own ideas about the ethics of killing. He says, well, it's only right if you swing the blade yourself. You should see her tears, hear her last words if you would kill her. And it's hard not to be reminded of Lyanna Stark when Ned says, see her tears and hear her last words. Uh, and and King and Robert just complains some more about Ned's Ned's objections, and he flings a, a wine flagon against the wall to shatter. Robert has a, a toddler style temper tantrum, uh, but Ned's like, "Look, for real, I'm not I'm not okay with this. I don't want to be involved in the murder of a child, so I'm out. I if, if you're going to do this, I give up my position as hand of the king." And Robert's like, no, fuck that, you stay. And he's like, Ned's like, no, nope, for real, I'm not standing for this, I'm out of here. And so Robert is defied, the king is defied for the first time in a long time. And he just bursts out with rage and he threatens to put Ned's head on a spike if he ever sees him again. And Ned leaves. So that was not the best handled situation by anyone involved, really. But basically, uh, uh, but Ned hears as he walks out, the other councillors immediately resume their discussion, talking about how to kill Daenerys, and Littlefinger mentions the faith. Oh, Pycelle mentions the Faceless Man, and Littlefinger talks about, oh, but the Faceless Man is so costly. Um, and he introduces the idea that the Faceless Men charge different amounts for assassinations depending on the status and importance of their target. So Princess Daenerys would cost a lot of money to assassinate. But it's also very interesting that Littlefinger knows so much about the Faceless Men and, indeed, their pricing structure. It makes you wonder if Littlefinger ever had anyone assassinated using the Faceless Men or considered it. Uh, he certainly probably has the money for it. Uh, Boros Blount, Blunt, Blount, Blunt is stationed outside the chamber, guarding. Gotta wonder what he heard and who he might have passed it on to. Uh, And Ned Ned storms out and he's like, wow, that was terrible. Um, But he feels kind of relieved to have decided to just leave his duty as Hand of the King and just go home to Winterfell. Uh, And he sort of thinks about uh, Robert's threat to kill him and he's like, no, I don't think Robert would, would do that. I think he's still my bro deep down. His rage will cool. Um, Ned recalls Rhaegar Targaryen. Uh, 15 years dead, yet Robert hates him as much as ever. Rhaegar's shadow is cast long over this story. Rhaegar comes up again and again, even though he is 15 years dead. Um, and and Ned also considers some of his other concerns, like the fact that his wife just uh, abducted Tyrion Lannister. No one, at, no one else at King's Landing seems to know that just yet. Uh, but Ned's worried what will happen when people do find out. Uh, and Ned tells his uh, steward, Vayon Poole, that, all right, we're out of here, mate. Pack, pack up pack up your baggos. We're, we're hoofing it. Uh, and uh, and he says, and Vayon's like, it's going to take us a couple of weeks to get our shit together. So Ned's like, all right, fine. Me and the girls, me and Sansa and Aya, we'll, we'll go ahead. Just us and a few guardsmen. We'll, we'll leave right away. And you could bring everyone else up later. Logistics. This is what you're missing out when you watch the show and don't read the books. Logistics. Hot, hot logistics coming at you. That's what you're missing. Aren't you glad you get to... All right, next page. Uh, and then Ned sits at the window and broods. Brooding seems to be a Stark family trait. Jon Snow is quite a brooder. He broods good, and so does Neddy Boy. Uh, and he thinks back of Winterfell, and he dreams of the snow, and he dreams of the godswood, and his children, and he thinks, oh, maybe I'll go back to Catelyn and make another child. He's always, he's already thinking, man, I'd love to be back home at Winterfell. Ned is a man of the North, and he says that he should never have left. But he thinks some more about the other shit that's going on. He thinks about, but what, why was John Aaron assassinated? He seems convinced now that John Aaron was killed, but he still doesn't know why. He still doesn't realize the shit about, um, well, yeah, he doesn't realize what's going on yet. Uh, and he also thinks, oh, by the way, maybe I should take a boat up to the north again so I could stop off at Dragonstone and talk to Stannis Baratheon. So Ned's pretty pretty convinced that Stannis Baratheon must know something about why John Aaron was, was killed and what the fuck's going on, which indeed he does. Um, 
and and yeah, it's also mentioned that the the sort of nation na- uh, the nature of Dragonstone as an ancient island fortress of House Targaryen. Dragonstone is a place of some import and will no doubt continue to play a role in the story ahead. Uh, and he's also thinking about yeah, and what about that other shit with with that one time someone tried to assassinate my son Bran. What the fuck's going on there? Is that related to to the death of John Aaron, or is that another secret, another different strand of the same web? This web of intrigue and secrets that entraps Ned in King's Landing, uh, and and he also thinks about Robert, and he's really sad that Robert, who was like his biffle, he's like BFF bro from back in the day, has way changed. He seems a different man now, and he reflects that Catelyn, his wife, did warn him. That that he used that Ned used to know Robert, but the Robert is now but Robert is now a stranger. He's been changed by his time as a king. Look what kinging has done to me, Robert had said. So things are different. So so Ned's like, fuck, look, I just want to get out of here. Uh, but then before he leaves, he gets a knock knock on the door, and in comes Peter Baelish, Littlefinger, the Mockingbird. And and Ned's like, fuck, all right, one more time, I'll have one more confusing, fucking annoying chat with a simpering twerp. It's Littlefinger. Uh, and Littlefinger's like, uh, and Ned's like, what do you want? Looking all cold and angry. And Littlefinger's like, eh, hey, well, I won't detain you for long. I'm I'm on my way to have dinner with Lady Tanda. Uh, roast suckling pig and lamprey pie. We go immediately into a food description. And Littlefinger talks about how uh, Lady Tanda Stokeworth wants to try and marry Littlefinger to Lollis Stokeworth, who is not exactly the most eligible of Westerosi bachelorettes. She's the sort of... Um, uh, what's the polite word for retarded again? She's the uh, she's the mentally handicapped Stokeworth daughter, who, who Bronn ends up marrying uh, to the amusement of everyone. Uh, but yes, Ta- Lady Tanda has been trying in vain to marry Peter Baelish to uh, Lola Stokeworth, but that has not happened because the only reason Littlefinger is actually going to these dinners is because he loves the lamprey pie that Tanda keeps serving him. <laughs> uh, and so Ned is like, well, don't let me keep you from your eels, my lord, which is one of the better lines in this series, I think. Uh, and and then Ned tells Peter to his face, by the way, I, you, you are probably the last person in the world who I want to fucking talk to right now. Because Ned, Ned is someone who, te- who tells you how he feels. He's honest. No secrets with Ned. So Ned straight up tells Peter that, I think you're a little bitch and I don't like you. Uh, and, and Peter's like, well, he says something clever, which is sort of what he does, uh, and they just sort of talk about some shit, Littlefinger talks about the faceless men some more, which is quite interesting, they talk about the attempted assassin, the, the planned assassination of Daenerys Targaryen and all that, uh, but then they sort of get down to, to brass tacks, and Peter's like, um, so Ned, you know you're a fucking idiot, right? And Ned's like, uh, mm, and and Peter's like, yeah, but no, you are you are as great. A, you are an enormous fool. You don't know what you're doing. In King's Landing, with all the intrigues and the politics, you are like a man dancing on rotten ice. And I dare say, when the ice cracks, you will make a noble splash. And of course, Peter Peter himself has been engineering many of the cracks in the ice that Ned's been dancing on. Uh, and 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 Peter's like, but when are you planning on leaving Winterfell? And Ned's saying, tomorrow. And Peter's like, ah, but I'll have to delay you just one moment because I'm going to take you to a brothel. Uh, it's going to be great. Now, now Peter's intentions here, uh, he's going to show uh, Ned uh, Barra, the child Barra, who is one of Robert Baratheon's bastards who has black hair as a way of triggering the realisation in Ned that uh, the Lannister children are not Robert Baratheon's children, the whole incest secret. But also, Littlefinger, as ever, has an ulterior motive. He wants to delay Ned leaving King's Landing in order to um, further ferment the Stark-Lannister conflict, which is sort of Littlefinger's overarching goal at this point, is to cause war, to create chaos, to make the ladder that Littlefinger loves to ascend. That's what's happening. So, thank you for listening to this episode of Game of Thrones Abridged on Alt Swift X. I hope you enjoyed, and I hope you will enjoy, the episodes that come in the future. Cheers. <laughs>